The debate continues to rage on. Should you be shooting an sRGB or Adobe RGB? I'm going to give you my thoughts about it on today's episode of... Ask David Bergman! Hey there, everybody. Welcome back. Here I am, as always, answering your photography questions. Remember, you can go to AskDavidBergman.com, submit your own photo questions right there on that site. I just might pick it to answer here on a future show. Today, I've got a question sent in from Greg S., and he wants to know... My Canon 5D Mark IV has two different color space options, sRGB and Adobe RGB. Which settings should I use and why would I change them? So what Greg is asking about here is called color management. Now this is a really, really deep rabbit hole to go down and it's very easy to get lost. But if you've watched me before, you know what I try to do. I like to take complicated topics and make them as simple as possible so you can get back to doing what's most important, which is shooting pictures. Now in most cameras, yes, you have the option to pick the color space you want to shoot in. What's a color space? Well, when you take a picture, your camera records all of the light and color that the sensor can handle. It can't capture nearly as much as our human eyes can see, of course, but it's an awful lot. The problem is that most devices that we use to view those images, like computers, monitors, and printers, can't actually show the huge range of colors that are initially captured. So somewhere along the way, all of those colors need to be squished, squished down into a smaller range of colors that can then be properly displayed. That's what color spaces do. Now, there are lots of them, but the two most commonly available in a camera are sRGB and Adobe RGB. sRGB is actually a smaller color space than Adobe RGB. Let's think of it this way. Imagine you were shown an elaborate painting and you had to copy it as closely as possible. You're given only three colors of paint to work with. Now, sure, you can combine the paints in different strengths and probably get dozens of different shades of colors. The original painting, however, might have many more nuanced or saturated tones than that, but that's all you can do with the color palette you were given. Let's call that sRGB. So now let's say you're actually given 100 different colored paints to work with. You should be able to reproduce the original pretty darn close. By combining those colors, you can get millions of different shades of colors. That's going to give you different levels of nuance and saturation that you don't have with only three colors. Let's say that's Adobe RGB. Now look, I know this is just a silly analogy and don't jump all over me. I absolutely understand it doesn't translate exactly to how color spaces work, but you get the general idea. Adobe RGB has more colors available. They say it's about 35 times as many as sRGB. So when the original data is compressed down to fit in there, it's gonna have more colors available to keep your image looking the same as when you first captured it. So it stands to reason that Adobe RGB is definitely better, right? Well, not so fast. So in reality, the difference between the two isn't as drastic as my horrible paint analogy. And in many cases, you won't really be able to see a difference. What really matters though, is your final output. Where will you or your viewers be seeing your images? I'd say that 99% of the photos being taken today are gonna to be viewed on a computer monitor or a phone screen. Despite the fact that Adobe RGB is a bigger color space, most web browsers, monitors, apps, and phone screens are only gonna display the smaller sRGB color space. It's really just been around a lot longer and has kind of become the baseline standard for most devices being produced today. So if you have an Adobe RGB image that you've worked on very carefully and it has lots of bright, vibrant colors, when you see it in a web browser or a phone app, it's automatically being converted to sRGB, which can't show quite the same level of saturation. So what it's going to do, it's going to clip off some of those colors and could dull down your images considerably. Now, if your pictures are meant only for a computer or a phone, I'd recommend just stay in sRGB the whole time. That way, when you work on your photos and get them looking exactly how you want them, they won't get changed at all when it's viewed by other people. Now, by the way, there are some high-end computer monitors that can show a wider color space. I use the BenQ SW320. It's a nice big 32-inch monitor, and I've used color calibration hardware to measure the fact that I'm seeing 99% of the Adobe RGB color gamut on that monitor. But even with that expensive monitor, any pictures that I see on the web have still been converted to sRGB by my web browser. Now, printing is a whole nother matter. Some printers can actually reproduce a very wide range of colors. So if you're a fine art photographer, for example, and your work is destined for large format gallery prints, you'd probably want to use Adobe RGB or even something bigger like Profoto RGB. But you need to make sure to stay in that same color space throughout the entire process. That's really the key. If at any step along the way your image is converted to a smaller color space, some colors are going to be thrown away and you're not going to get them back. And that's really just if you're printing yourself. 
Most commercial or online labs where you would send your images to be printed, they're just gonna want them in sRGB anyway. You might wanna check with them if you're unsure. Now, as for Greg's question about selecting the color space in your camera, well, like many of the settings in our cameras, it doesn't really matter if you're shooting RAW. The RAW file is all of that original data that's captured by the sensor before most of the processing or conversions are done. So when you open that file in a program like Lightroom, Photoshop, or Capture One, you're actually working with all of the original data. But as you do your edits and then save out your final image, usually as a JPEG, you have to then choose what color space you wanna use so no more conversions have to be done. Those would then alter the colors and we don't want that to happen. So if you're only shooting JPEGs and not using RAW files for some reason, I don't know, it's a bit of a quandary. I mean, most of us are gonna just use sRGB throughout the entire workflow. I personally might wanna shoot Adobe RGB initially to have more colors saved in my first file, especially if I'm shooting something with very saturated greens or reds, for example. But at some point, I'm gonna have to convert it to sRGB and then make those adjustments for, for it to be viewed on a computer. Now, as you probably know, I don't recommend shooting JPEGs only because it just limits your options. This is just one more example of how it limits your option. I'd much rather have all of that data saved in a RAW file and then I can decide later. It's kind of the best of both worlds. The bottom line is that Adobe RGB is good for the photographer who's carefully calibrating all of their devices, is comfortable with advanced color management, wants to control every subtle nuance of color, and is printing their work. For the rest of us, Dad, just use sRGB. You'll be fine. Thanks, Greg. I hope, it, I hope that clears some of the things up for you. Um, anybody else, if you have questions, remember, go to AskDavidBergman.com. Fill out that form there. I'm also still doing my one-on-one -on -one Zoom consultations. If you need help with a particular issue and want to talk with me directly, you can check that out at AskDavidBergman.com. I've got fewer slots now because I am back on the road, so those are very limited. Make sure you go over there and check that out. I hope you're already a subscriber to the Adorama YouTube channel. If not, go ahead and click that button down below. Use that little bell icon. You'll be notified of all the new shows from myself and the other photo hosts right here on Adorama TV. Remember, I'm back every Monday, 10 a.m. Eastern. I'll be back here next week with a brand new question. I hope you'll join me right here on Ask David Burton.